Okay, so unfortunately, um, the parts of the video um, was um, disrupted uh, for this part of the video, so I'm recording it again. Hopefully, it doesn't matter for you guys. Um, okay, so as I was uh, uh, explaining, this was the recording, a simultaneous uh, fMRI bold signal and LFP multi-unit recording uh, performed by Logothesis Group in 2000, um, 2001. And now uh, I'm going to explain what this you know, graph is. So first, let's go from the um, time of the uh, time course of the stimulus presentation. Okay. So from zero to 10, there was nothing on the screen in front of the monkey. And then from 10 to 34 seconds, there was some kind of flickering stimulus in front of the monkeys. And then after that, um, now again, the stimulus became completely blank, you know, gray screen um, display. And then, uh, so uh, now uh, Logothesis compares three major uh, uh, measurements from this system. One is a bold signal uh, with this, you know, uh, orange shades, and then local field potential, black, and so multi-unit activity, green, and the spike density function, blue. And here, for our purpose, green and blue is more or the same, okay? And then let's uh, focus on the fMRI signal. First thing, you notice is that the fMRI signal is zero until the stimulus is on, and then four seconds later or so, it starts to increase. And as I explained uh, in the last you know, uh, segment of the video, both signal is uh, usually increase um, when the neurons consumes a lot of energy, and then in response to that local consumption, uh, the blood supply comes in, and then that is detected as an increase of the bold signal, uh, or locally over there. And as you see here, uh, in monkeys, it's the same, and in the visual cortex, it's especially so. Uh, after onset of the stimulus, four seconds later, it starts to increase like this, okay? And then at the offset of the stimulus, when the stimulus, you know, uh, flickering finishes, then it starts to, uh, it still continues to be active because there is a delay in the response uh, to the, you know, um, the energy consumption termination and then goes to, you know, baseline. But it goes even under the, you know, uh, baseline. This means that the bold signal after uh, it's supplying, you know, um, um, supply the lots of, you know, blood, you know, to one area, after the stimulus is turned off, and then um, the neuron starts to become, you know, uh, calm as usual, uh, uh, you know, as a baseline. Then the blood supply becomes, uh, uh, you know, uh, momentarily goes below baseline. And that's, you know, here, uh, compared to zero, it goes negative. Okay, this is a known finding about the bold signal, one of the complications. And then uh, on the other hand, uh, multi-unit activity, uh, lots of neuron spiking activity goes up right after the stimulus onset. And then uh, it's curious, but you know, it's also true that um, uh, after a couple of seconds, one to two seconds, most neuron loses its activity to uh, baseline. Some of them, you know, continues to fire. But on average, as a population, it starts to become almost like a um, baseline level. And that's when, uh, why you are, you know, seeing the green and blue lines to be close to zero. And then when the stimulus is turned off from the display, it goes even negative than the baseline, like here. And then this um, both reduction after the stimulus onset as well as you know um, offset is closely related to the um, phenomena called the perceptual adaptation that we will be talking um, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, and then um, the other uh, measure, local field potential, uh, that shoots up after the stimulus onset. And then the, this goes even above, you know, this, you know, um, nine standard de um, deviation units here. We can't present it here. It goes like crazy and then comes back, but it keep on uh, ribbing around, you know, above the baseline until the stimulus uh, is turned off. And then after the stimulus turning off, you know, it goes slightly below the baseline and then uh, comes back. And uh, what this means for our purpose is that uh, uh, at least bold signal that what fMRI measures and the local population spikes can be completely dissociated like around this um, area and also here. 
when the spikes happens a lot, both signal can be uh, completely silent. And when the spikes goes down to the baseline, both signal can substantially increase. Why is that? Now, one potential explanation rests on this you know, uh, LFP, local field potential. And that's the reason why you know, this paper was published in Nature. So what the logothesis found was that a local field potential uh, during this sustained period correlates with a uh, bold signal. And what it means is that the local field potential is sensitive to the synaptic inputs from other areas. And when the um, synaptic inputs comes into this you know, particular area and then it cancels within the neuronal computation, and then it doesn't potentially you know, re uh, generate a lot of spikes as you can see here. However, this increase uh, of the input from other areas can generate a lot of metabolic demand and energy consumption at the synaptic transmitter uh, control. And that is the one that drives this bold signal increase here. So bold signal is primarily the metabolic uh, uh, measure uh, of the brain. So it may, makes actually in a sense, uh, lot of sense. And in fact, so this uh, overall, means that the uh, um, bold signal is uh, correlated with the uh, inputs into the particular area rather than uh, output from the area. And it can potentially have an uh, impact on how to interpret some of the uh, uh, findings in the neural correlates of consciousness uh, as we discuss in the next, next couple of weeks. So in summary, uh, Neural activity can be measured in uh, various uh, methods, such as electroencephalography, and the cheapest method, and the MEG, which I didn't actually talk, but uh, is uh, relatively expensive, as expensive as fMRI, roughly like $600 per hour. And then uh, EcoG and LFP in humans are relatively rare methodology, only performed in subset of the epilepsy patient who cannot uh, be treated by the uh, drugs. And all of these are the electrical summation of the population of the neural activity or spikes or single unit activity or firing. Okay. And all of them get some kind of filtering, averaging, smoothing operation, and the most severely affects on the EEG, which is uh, most you know, uh, noisy compared to others. And finally, fMRI is a non-invasive uh, new technology, uh, which uh, offers a highly nice uh, spatial resolution, but it's also a very complex uh, kind of signal. And it most likely reflects input to the area than the output from the area, but its uh, detail is still you know, under the in investigation. Finally, this is a, a nice figure that puts uh, all the uh, methods that neuroscientist uses uh, nowadays into one graph. And this was uh, generated by the Terry Sainowski from UCSD. And he generated the same kind of thing uh, in 1988 and then uh, regenerated in 19, uh, 20, 2014. And as you can see, fMRI emerged uh, you know, over the last um, 30 years. And the y-axis of this graph is a spatial resolution. You know, uh, going from brain to uh, robe and then the maps and the new nucleus, neurons and the uh, layer, then dendrite synapses and so on. And then uh, x axis is the time going from uh, months to, you know, milliseconds and seconds and so on. And the important thing uh, for us is to point out a couple of methods for our uh, week two, four, uh, eight general club. So, first three. The brain regions is uh, least, you know, um, uh, sensitive in terms of spatial, uh, uh, spatial and also temporal resolution because it develops time, and uh, but but it uh, plays a really critical role in consciousness research because it can uniquely um, tell us about you know causal role of a particular brain area to the conscious experience. And the next, you know, uh, slow method is fMRI imaging, as I explained. Uh, the uh, resolution is uh, on the you know seconds to uh, and also you know the size is very um, good but um, you know uh, it's also improving over the uh, years. And the EEG and the MEG is uh, um, very coarse uh, in terms of the spatial resolution, but the temporal resolution wise it's very good. And some of the papers are um, 
looking at micro stimulation of the electrodes implanted inside the head. And that is combined usually with the local field potential recording from ECOG or LFP from the uh, epilepsy patients. And the micro stimulation can um, uniquely uh, uh, establish a causal tie between the activity of the neural, um, neural um, activity in particular areas of the brain to the parsef. So that's uh, very important in our consciousness research. And finally, single units or uh, single neuron spiking is the method um, recorded here. And uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, the methods that we need to uh, understand for the current uh, uh, the, the week two for uh, general crowd presentation. And we'll go into some more details uh, as uh, the lecture goes. And today's lecture is uh, overall a bit shorter than the other lectures uh, to compensate for the um, week one lecture, which was a bit long. Okay, see you next week.